now that we've covered gene structure and gene regulation, it's uh, possible to tackle the subject of biotechnology, which is utilizes our knowledge of gene structure and regulation to produce products that are of benefit to humans, both medicinal and agricultural. And uh, shown here is an electron micrograph of a small plasmid DNA molecule, a small circular DNA molecule that replicates independently in bacteria. That's what plasmids do. And this molecule has made, these plasmid molecules have made possible much of biotechnology. So we'll, we'll be talking a lot about plasmids as we uh, progress. Now, the birth of biotechnology really came about when a certain class of enzymes were discovered called restriction enzymes. And these enzymes were discovered these enzymes were discovered as part of a basic research program that was in, uh, run by a Swiss biochemist, Werner Arber. And Arber was interested in a phenomenon called bacterial immunity. So he was, he was looking at the ability of bacteria to be immune to particular viruses. Now we don't normally think of uh, single-celled organisms as having an, an immune system, but Arber indeed found that bacteria that he was growing he had, let's say, strain A of bacteria and strain B of bacteria. Strain A of bacteria would permit the growth of lambda uh, viruses, bacteriophage, on A if they were, uh, had been grown on A for a long time. So lambda phage, lambda bacteriophage grown on strain A bacteria would produce lots of progeny, of progeny viruses, and they were perfectly capable of growing on strain A bacteria. So here we have the virus, and here we produce progeny virus, and here we have the bacteria. And likewise, there was a strain B of E. coli bacteria that, that Arbor was dealing with, and these bacteria would support the growth of, the infection of a strain of a, a lambda bacteriophage B that would grow on strain B bacteria and produce progeny phage at high levels. So here we have B bacteria are not immune to infection by bacteriophage that had been grown and, and um, for a long time on, on this B strain. That is, these bacteria were susceptible to infection and by, by um, strain B bacteriophage, and A strain bacteria were not immune to the A lambda bacteriophage viruses. However, if a phage that had been grown, that is bacteriophage that had been grown on strain B bacteria were used to infect bacterial strain A, there was no production of lambda B. They were unable, these lambda B viruses were unable to grow on bacterial strain A. And likewise, Reciprocally, the A-grown lambda phage that could grow perfectly well on strain A bacteria when used to infect B would not produce any lambda A progeny. They would, they would not grow. So what we had here was that B bacteria were immune to A viruses and A bacteria were immune to B viruses. And what Arbor discovered, the, the investigator here was the Swiss biochemist, as I've said, Arbor. What Arbor discovered was that bacteria, different bacterial strains, produce um, different enzymes called restriction enzymes. And they, he, they, they are called restriction enzymes because those enzymes restrict the growth of particular viruses. So bacteria strain A had restriction enzymes that would restrict the growth of lambda B uh, phage. They would not grow on A and vice versa for B. <laughs> Excuse me. And what these restriction enzymes do is they digest DNA. And likewise, strain B would have restriction enzymes that would, that would digest um, the DNA from A viruses. So the immunity that Arbor discovered was due to the ability of bacteria to 
produce enzymes called restriction enzymes that would digest or cut DNA. And the question then arose, well, why, why, first of all, two questions arise. If that's true, restriction enzymes allow, for example, the immunity of B bacteria to A viruses. Why is it that B bacteria are, are not immune to B viruses? And likewise, why is it the bacteria B don't cut up their own DNA if they have these DNA damaging enzymes, these enzymes which cut DNA? And the answer came because in addition to restriction enzymes, there were modification enzymes. There are modification enzymes. And what modification enzymes do is they protect DNA from cutting by restriction enzymes. So modification enzymes are protective enzymes that protect DNA from the action of restriction enzymes. And modification enzymes do that by methylating DNA, sticking methyl groups on DNA. So they are methylases. Those methylases um, uh, target DNA of, of bacteria and methylate it at particular positions that prevent the restriction enzymes from cutting that DNA. And so what happens is, is that strain B has restriction enzymes which cut DNA, but it has modified its DNA with methylases that protect that DNA from uh, being digested so the bacteria can can be fine and viruses that grow on B have had their DNA modified by the same modification enzymes but bacteria that were grown on strain A have been uh, subjected to different modifications uh, by the by bacterial strain A and are not protected from digestion by strain B restriction enzymes so this is, these systems are known as host modification, that is methylation, restriction systems. And they govern the ability of bacteria to, um, to digest foreign DNA, but not their own DNA. Now viruses can adapt to the, um, restric the, um, the, the restriction modification system of a particular strain of bacteria, because if any bacteria phage, any viruses do make it through an infection, initial infection. For example, if some A viruses made it through B and were able to, some, some were able to mount an infection and produce progeny uh, A, even to a small extent, their DNA would be modified. They, it would be methylated in the same way that strain B would be methylated. And therefore, from then on, those modified bacteriophage would be able to infect strain B bacteria, and they would, we could call them B viruses then. So this host modification system is a very interesting um, system that involves two sets of, of enzymes, restriction enzymes and modification enzymes. And Arbor's discovery of these enzymes led to what we would term modern biotechnology by allowing us to make recombinant DNA, to recombine DNA from different sources using these restriction enzymes in creative ways, as we will see shortly. So those are the, that's the discovery of restriction enzymes. And now let's look at how restriction enzymes work. So if we have a particular sequence of DNA that is recognized by a particular restriction enzyme, and each restriction enzyme has its own particular nucleotide sequence recognition site. In this case, the enzyme, restriction enzyme ECOR1 from E. coli, uh, will digest DNA, will cut DNA, cut the sugar phosphate backbones of double helical DNA in an asymmetric fashion whenever a sequence of GAATTC is found on one strand and CTTAAG on the other strand, complementary of course. And it cuts the, that DNA in such a way as to produce overhangs. So if we look at this top partner here, uh, as a, a product of this digestion of the DNA by ECOR1, we see that what we have is a five prime overhang. This is, the, this is three prime here because these strands are running anti-parallel. We have a five prime overhang of single-stranded uh, DNA at the cut site. And the other molecule would have also a five prime overhang. That would be this molecule here. 
would also have a five prime overhang. And it became immediately apparent that this technique, that the digestion of DNA with restriction enzymes would allow the recombination of DNA from different sources. Because you could, for example, produce molecules uh, like this from, by, by, by digesting DNA from one source, let's call this source one. That, that DNA could be from any organism or um, it could be from a plasmid DNA. It could be uh, any, any source of DNA. And here we have another source of DNA and that is digested with the same restriction enzyme. And here we note that the, this top partner here produced as a product of digestion of this DNA sequence by EcoR1 would yield this, would be this molecule here with a five prime overhang, three prime. These two molecules have complementary sequences of nucleotides with their sugar phosphate backbones running in the uh, correct direction so as to produce by annealing hydrogen bonding of AATT with TTAA, that would produce an intact DNA molecule provided that the gaps that would occur when this hydrogen bonding occurred could be sealed and we already know an enzyme that will seal mix in the sugar phosphate backbone and that enzyme is ligase. So by first digesting DNA from different sources, here's source 2 DNA, if we one digest DNA from different sources from source 1 and source 2 let's say and two anneal those DNAs together using the sticky ends produced by restriction enzyme, enzyme digestion, and then three, ligate the molecules with DNA ligase, we will produce an intact molecule that results from this process that is, represents what we would call recombinant DNA. That is to say, we have recombined DNA from different sources so as to produce a, a functional DNA molecule. And this breakthrough then represented the, our abil the first ability to obtain DNA from any source and mix it with DNA from another source and use uh, one of those sources as a vector so as to clone DNA from the, from the source of interest. So genes of interest or DNA sequences of interest could be cloned uh, by by running, by doing the following. We know that bacterial cells, for example, have a large chromosome of about 3.6, 3, well, 3.6 to 4.2 times 10 to the 6 base pairs, about 4.2 million base pairs long. But we also know that they can harbor small circular plasmids, which have their own replication origins and can repl replicate independently of the host chromosomes. So these plasmids then, we've talked about them before, if we show one of these plasmids, those plasmids could be opened up by cutting with the restriction enzyme, and then source DNA from another source, let's say human DNA, or corn DNA, or DNA from any other source, could be cut with the restriction enzyme. And that then could be ligated into the open ends produced by restriction enzyme digestion of the plasmid. So we could open up the plasmid with restriction digestion and we could then insert into that plasmid by virtue of producing sticky ends by digesting another source of DNA that was digested with the same restriction enzyme. We can insert that into the plasmid, allow that to anneal, and then use ligase to seal the sugar phosphate backbones, and we now have we now have uh, recombined a molecule of interest, or let's call it a gene of interest, into plasmid DNA, and that plasmid can be reintroduced into bacteria, and those bacteria can grow, and the plasmid will replicate to many copies. So now we have plasmids in bacteria that have incorporated the recombinant plasmid containing recombinant DNA and bacteria can be grown to many billions of cells in a very short period of time, with the result that we can produce billions and billions of clones of DNA 
of our gene of interest. Our gene of interest will be inserted into plasmids and we can obtain many billions of copies of this plasmid and therefore what we will have done is to clone our gene of interest. We will have produced billions and billions of copies of that DNA sequence, that gene of interest, um, by virtue of using the plasmid as a vector. So here we are dealing with, we will call these vectors. The plasmid is a vector that allows the cloning, that is the production of identical copies of DNA of interest. And the DNA of interest then is, we, we say that it is cloned into a bacterial plasmid, and that plasmid is then grown in bacterial cells, which are allowed to replicate in liquid culture medium, and then we can harvest those bacteria and isolate the DNA. And that, that plasmid vector in this case has then allowed the cloning of a uh, gene of interest. And this is really the technique that gave rise to modern biotechnology, but remember that this was born out of our, our um, understanding of the basic biology of DNA structure and DNA enzymes and of the very interesting study on the basic biology of bacterial immunity. So that, that's the how restriction enzyme digestions and ligations work. And um, another key technique in bi biotechnology when, is the ability to separate fragments of DNA produced by restriction enzyme digestion on uh, through, through gel electrophoresis. And as you know, DNA is a negatively charged molecule. And when DNA is placed in a gel matrix that's made from the polymer agarose, a, <clears throat> an algal uh, polymer, the DNA, uh, that gel that we place the DNA in, that agarose gel, can be subjected to an electric field such that the DNA will move from the positive pole of the gel to the, I'm sorry, from the negative pole of the gel, if we apply an electric field here, towards the positive pole because DNA is a, a negatively charged molecule. So DNA samples will migrate in the gel from the negative pole to the positive pole, positive, negative. But they will do so at different rates based on the length of the DNA fragment because small little, small fragments of DNA if it, if it is migrating through the gel matrix, has relatively little surface area with which to engage and therefore will move through the matrix quickly, through the agarose matrix quickly. But if you have a really long piece of DNA, as that tries to snake its way through the gel matrix, through the agarose gel matrix, it cannot go very fast because it has more surface area with which to, um, uh, with which to, um, uh, experience friction with the gel matrix with. So small fragments move fast in the gel and large fragments move slower, faster and slower. And in that way, so different restriction fragments, that is fragments produced by the digestion of DNA, can be separated in an agarose gel according to size. And they can be visualized um, by staining gels with a fluorescent dye that binds to DNA and, and uh, indicates what, uh, the DNA fragments that are present. And here we see these are the larger fragments, and then as we look down the gel, we see smaller fragments. So they've, they've been separated according to size. So we can t take DNA, cut with the restriction, um, uh, a restriction enzyme. Restriction enzymes are also known as restriction endonucleases because endo means inside, and nuclease means digesting DNA or digesting nucleic acid. So they are not starting from the end of a DNA, but they internally cut DNA. So restriction enzymes are restriction endonucleases. And here in this digestion, we produce a short segment, and here a long segment. And in this digestion, a different DNA sample, we have a medium segment, two medium segments. And in this one, we produce a very short segment and a long segment. And all of these fragments can be resolved on a, on a gel. So for example, this digestion would produce these two fragments, a long segment and a short segment because our uh, electric field is minus to plus here and the fragments have migrated in the gel then in this direction. And here we have a small fragment and here we have the long, the large fragment. In this middle digestion, we produce two medium segments 
that differ slightly in their length in this case. So that we see that those are the two medium segments there. And then this digestion produces a very short fragment, this one, and a much longer fragment, this one. So this could be the same DNA molecule cut with different restriction enzymes, or these could be different DNA molecules, um, which would have the restriction recognition sequences at different locations. And that's the very important thing to remember about restriction enzymes, is that because they are sequence specific, they only cut at the sites at which they are specific for. And therefore, different restriction enzymes can be used to cut DNA in different places. So in the next part of this lecture, we'll pick up with looking at DNA vectors, the plasmids that we've already mentioned, and also bacteriophage vectors. And then we'll, we'll introduce the concepts of DNA library construction and <clears throat> other techniques in biotechnology that have proven uh, very fruitful in analyzing and manipulating DNA. And that's what we'll pick up.